The last two Sundays, we heard in our gospel a dialogue that is of crucial importance between Jesus and Peter. We saw how Peter received the keys, how he received an name change from Simon to Peter, but last Sunday we also saw how Peter still thought much more like men and not so much as God. In this present Sunday, Jesus is not talking to Peter, but Jesus is going to be talking to the 12 disciples. And this fragment that we have just heard comes from chapter 18 of the Gospel of Matthew. And this chapter is all about the discipline of the church. It's a chapter about the church. So in today's homily, I would like to share with you two things. Number one, a short comment on the theological importance of this dialogue between Jesus and the disciples. And on the second part, a somewhat more practical application on fraternal correction. So the first comment is, in this passage, Jesus is going to use an expression very similar to the one he used with Peter. Listen, he says to the apostles, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. These words seem very familiar because Jesus gave the same power to Peter alone, and now he's giving this power to all of his disciples. How does the church understand and read these words? How do, how do we interpret the fact that he gives the disciples this power? We understand that the disciples, because they receive this, this power, they have a triple, let's say, capacity. Number one, being able to bind on earth means the disciples have the power to forgive sins. That is something that is part of Jesus' words today. Second, the disciples have the authority to excommunicate someone who perseveres in their mistake. This is something that not very often we see, but Sometimes, of course, if there is a Christian who perseveres in their mistake, either the Pope or a bishop is in the capacity to excommunicate this baptized person because of the power they have received today. And also, the power that the apostles received today gives them the authority to establish on morals and doctrine what is right and what is wrong and the authority to teach, and to correct other people. We see that the apostles are receiving, let's say, a task to be masters of the faith. And this is all synthesized in the words we have heard. You have power to bind on earth, and you have power to bind on heaven. Now let us think about a more practical application about today's gospel. And I would like to share with you a couple of thoughts on a spiritual mercy work, fraternal correction, telling someone that you love where he or she is mistaken. So I know that it's not easy to make corrections. And normally, when someone is committing a sin, it is easier to look to a different place and to pretend that nothing is going wrong. But if we pay attention to the first reading, the prophet reminds us, and this is a catch, please pay attention, fraternal correction is important because if you don't do it when it's necessary, you're committing a sin of omission. I will repeat this, repeat this because it's important. Fraternal correction is not only about doing a good thing, It's about doing it when it's important, because if you fail to do it, you commit a sin of omission. You are not helping a person that is in need, and in failing to do so, to do so you commit a sin of omission. 
Sins of omission can be as grave as sins of commission. And today the gospel teaches us, teaches us how to do a fraternal correction. And I think there are three useful criteria for us to learn. The first one is, if you're going to correct someone, do it always because you love that person and not because that person bothers you or you feel, you know, uncomfortable with that person. And I suppose that this recommendation can be very useful for parents because I understand that small kids sometimes may drive parents crazy, especially when you tell them, don't leave your clothes around, wash your dishes, and sometimes I suppose kids don't do that, and you feel tempted to correct them, but not always through love, but sometimes just because you want to kill someone. So the first criteria is good corrections, Fraternal corrections come from love. Second criteria, if you know that someone is in the need of a correction, do it privately. Don't do it in front of other people. Don't make the other person feel bad or humiliated. Look for the right moment to bring that person apart and in the privacy of the conversation between the two of you, you tell that person what that person needs to improve. And I think that this recommendation is also very useful for parents because it's easier to correct your kids in the moment. But I think it's much more useful when you take your time and you tell your kid, could you come for a second so we can have a conversation? When I, like, when I look back at my teenager ages, I'm very grateful with my dad because I can remember at least three moments of my life when I was in the need of a correction, very well deserved. And my dad, he came into my room and he said, we need to have a talk. He didn't correct me before my mom and my siblings. He took me apart and he made a correction, just the two of us. So the second recommendation for a good correction is do it always privately just like the gospel suggests. And the, third and the third recommendation for a good fraternal correction is be prudent about it. And this is the way I think about fraternal correction. I think that when you do a fraternal correction, you have to be like a surgeon who is doing a heart procedure. You don't do fraternal corrections in a clumsy way. You have to think about the words you say, you have to be specific. You have to be careful, looking for the right time. And for example, I'm very grateful because since I got here, there's people who have taken the time to help me out and make me some fraternal corrections. For example, many people have had the charity after Mass to tell me, Father, you have to work on the pronunciation of this and this word that you're getting wrong. Another person told me, Father, this word, you used it, but I think you're translating from Spanish and it doesn't work in English. Another person, he made me a correction a little bit more, maybe not so specific. He just said, Father, you're, you should speak less in your homilies. <laughs> to this, he said, I asked him, do you have any feedback for me? And he said, less words. But I think a third criteria for a good correction is be prudent. And being prudent means being specific. It's not useful when someone tells you your homies are bad. It's helpful when they tell you, speak slower, speak less, whatever. And uh, to finish this homily, I want to say there's also a flip side to this fraternal correction. And if Jesus is encouraging us to do fraternal corrections, I think we should ask ourselves, do I know how to receive a correction? Because sometimes I think that, for example, in a context of marriage, sometimes spouses can give fraternal corrections 
the other, to the other part, and sometimes spouses feel like they're being attacked or feel like they're in the need to defend themselves. But I want to remind you that fraternal corrections, we're supposed to receive them with a humble heart and gratefulness. So I want to share something that happened to me this week. A person came to my office and they said to me, Father, there's someone who, well, is asking me to tell you to stop doing this thing. And I felt very angry. And I said, this wouldn't happen in Peru. People here are too sensible. And then I, and you know, and I, you know, I started getting worked up. I didn't tell anything to this person because I didn't have the time. But then I started thinking, wait, is this a right attitude? And I said, you know what? I think that the right attitude when someone corrects you is to be grateful. So I said, Lord, instead of getting all worked up because someone gave me a fraternal correction, I said, you know what, Lord? Thank you because I was humble today. Thank you because I'm clumsy and you remind me that I have to improve. Thank you because I can see so many aspects in my life where I still have to change. So brothers, in synthesis, number one, this gospel reminds us of the power that the apostles have received to forgive sins, to excommunicate if it's needed, to teach. Second, this gospel reminds us that fraternal correction is important because if you omit to do it when it's needed, it can become a sin of omission. But remember that we are supposed to this, do these corrections with charity, in secret, with prudence. But if we have to correct, this means that we also have to know how to receive corrections. Be grateful and humble if you have the privilege of being corrected this week. So I want to finish. <laughs> Too many words, Father. I want to finish. I want to finish with something that I think can be homework. Number one, ask yourself. Is someone in need, is someone in need of your correction and you're failing to do so? Is someone in your family, is someone maybe one of the people you live with, your housemate, your roommate, if so, is someone in the need of correction and you're failing to do so and incurring in a sin of omission? Second, homework, if you receive a correction, be humble and grateful.